where the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians that the spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. For these are contrary to each other. There is my flesh, my sinful nature, my depraved nature, which battles against the spirit, hates the spirit, fights against the spirit and is forever trying to drag us away from the power of the Spirit that he may get us in his own claws and drag us to the place where he presently goes. And the Spirit resists him in me. The Spirit resists him. But because I still have my sinful flesh, the battle is fierce. The battle is almost sometimes more than I can bear. And I cry out with Paul, the good that I would, I do not. And the evil that I would not, that I do. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then comes Paul's triumphant, victorious shout. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, his perfect work. And then Romans 8 goes on to say, this is the spirit, the spirit that delivered you from the bondage of sin. If I may put it that way, and there's a text in 1 Peter 5 which speaks of this. I speak as a man, I don't know how else to say it, but... The Spirit has his hands full trying to save us. The Spirit is all he can do to bring us to salvation. We, we sort of think of it in terms of some kind of a magic. Nothing to it. Snap of the fingers and we're saved. Oh no! Oh no! The Spirit wars against the flesh. And the war is dreadful and bitter. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter 5 that the righteous are scarcely saved. It's as if the Holy Spirit has all he can do to get us to heaven because of the power of our own sinful flesh. We're saved by the skin of our teeth. We barely make it. We, as it were, stagger the last few steps into the glory that awaits us. Because we are such dreadfully wicked sinners. But the Spirit has the victory because Christ has the victory and he gives it to us. And so I stand in the midst of the world, surrounded by a wicked world, in the full consciousness of all my sins. And I shout triumphantly with Paul in Romans 8, Who shall separate me from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ? Christ. The Spirit. The Spirit preserves the church. Don't worry about that. Church will be preserved. We may do our best to oppose the church and its work and its ministry. Don't worry about that. The Spirit will preserve the church. The Spirit will gather the church. The Spirit will maintain the church against all the fiery darts of the evil one. And the Spirit will deliver the church to glory to God in heaven as the perfected body of Christ. That's the Spirit. He makes me partakers of Christ and all his benefits, that he may comfort me and abide with me forever. And so finally this, he is the comforter, Jesus says. But let it be clearly understood, he is the comforter because he is the spirit of truth. Jesus identifies the two in John 14, 15, and 16. The same spirit who is the spirit of truth comforts us. And the meaning is that he comforts us by his word. 
Well, you say yes, but all the ungodly have the word too. Anybody in the world can open the Bible and read it and understand what it says. Yes, 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 of course. That's why the word is written in the simple way that it is, so that everybody can understand it. Do you remember what Jesus said, don't you, when the disciples pressed him for the reason why he taught in parables? <clears throat> referring to those wicked Jews who had memorized the whole Old Testament scriptures. Seeing they see and do not believe, and hearing they hear and do not understand. Why? Because it is God's purpose to harden them, lest they should be converted and saved. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear, and understand the mysteries of the kingdom. The Spirit opens our eyes, not just simply to see, which is also possible for the wicked, in a natural sense of the word, but to see spiritually, to hear spiritually, to say, this is the truth. This is the truth. I believe this with all my heart. That takes the Spirit. And when the Spirit does that and we appropriate by faith the truth of the Scriptures, we appropriate Christ and all His benefits as our own. Let's be reminded of the fact that the truth is important. Not a wishy-washy truth that's watered down for the sake of false ecumenism. Not a truth that isn't worth 10 cents and is about as sloppy as a pail full of slop that's fed to the hogs. Not that. The solid biblical truth of the scriptures in which we must grow, and in understanding it, we are saved. That's the work of the Spirit. He uses, he ties himself to, he binds himself unbreakably to the truth of the Scriptures. And will not work in any other way. Pentecostalism, to the contrary, notwithstanding. They make the Holy Spirit, of course, more important than the Father and the Son. He's the only one that's important. He's the only one that counts. And the Spirit reprimands them and sharply condemns them and says, I don't speak of myself. I speak of him that sent me, that you may see the wonderful works of God through Jesus Christ. But the charismatics in their foolishness and wickedness brush that all aside and make the spirit the only important one. That's wrong. Dead wrong. The spirit points us to Christ and works faith in our hearts to lay hold on Christ and on his truth. We may, and we do, read the spirit when we are uninterested in the truth, when we set ourselves up as standards of the truth, when we claim to know it all ourselves, when we set ourselves above the church and its teachings, we grieve the Spirit. Because, as the psalmist puts it in Psalm 51, we sin against His grace. Think of all he has given to us through the Spirit. Are we then to snub the Spirit and speak boastfully of ourselves and condemn his work in the church? God forbid. Walk in the Spirit, the Apostle says, by his power, and you will never fulfill the lusts of the flesh.